My name's Reagan Wascom. I'm a guy who thinks about water all the time. I'm not a historian, and I understand a lot of your interest is in the history of the area. Um, I'm, more, I'm a scientist, but in water, history really matters. And so even water engineers and scientists have to pay attention at least a little bit to the history in order to understand why we are where we are today. And our water history really put us where we are. It's very complicated. And when you think about Colorado water, you've got to understand not just the history, but the law, the administration, the science, and the people. And so at CSU, we've got like 150 courses on water, semester-long courses. And we're going to talk about it for an hour or so today. So there's a lot to talk about. And George knows a lot about water as well. I, I want to have dialogue with you all and, and help talk about what you're really interested in. So that's my goal. I've got some slides and I handed them out to you because I'm probably not going to go over everything in my slides and they're really uh, more sort of an outline for me to, to talk about. But what I thought I would do is sort of lay out some real basics about the history of the Poudre, which by the way is a really important river in, in western water. And it, you know, the Poudre's not a very big river, but it's had really significant impact on the way that we manage water, the way we administer water, our legal structure. And part of it's been because uh, CSU being here, frankly, right on the Poudre, and so a lot of the thinking about Western water really evolved right here in this community and propagated out from here, which is really a pretty cool thing about our, our history. So here's what I'm going to say. Interrupt me at any time. Raise your hand. Dispute me. Tell me you can't hear me. Whatever. This is your two hours. And, we're, and George and I are just happy to be here with you. So how many of you all have seen these Worthington Whitridge paintings that he did on the South Platte and, and the Pooter? He did these really cool pictures of the South Platte in particular that I love because the South Platte has changed so much. If somebody knows where that picture, where he sat and painted that, let me know, but it's so interesting. I think he painted these very realistic landscapes and Indian pictures, and um, I, I like to look, at, they're online, you can look at them, but you can kind of, hey, there it is, with the great big old cottonwood galleries, and it's kind of a sleepy stream coming through. And here's what we know about the Pooter, is that, you know, you think about pre-European settlement here in the area, what do you got? You got the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Utes hunting up and down the river, right? This was their territory before it was ours, for sure. They did not impact the river here in Fort Collins much at all that we can tell. Now, that's not the case in other places in Colorado. There was some evidence of, for example, down in Mesa Verde, they irrigated. There's no doubt about that. They built reservoirs down there on the Arkansas and the Rio Grande, there's some early evidence of both American Indian diversion as well as uh, Spanish diversions and some really old stuff. But on the Poudre, we don't see that quite like we do on some of the other rivers. The first big change really started to occur when the trappers showed up, right? Looking for beaver, for those beaver hats for the Englishmen to wear. And, you know, those were the Frenchies, right? Uh, French guys that came in and they were amazing people that canoed up, you know, up the rivers and set the traps and they modified the stream very significantly. How so? How do you think they modified the stream? Wiped out the beavers. Wiped out the beavers. The beavers were the real engineers, right? And they very much affected um, how rivers flowed in the west. The beavers just dam them up and that, that would change the hydrology of the rivers, right? And you'd get late season flows. So these guys came in, trapped out all the beavers, and by the, the 40s, they had gotten the job done. And I think also the taste for the beaver hats in England kind of faded, you know. So, so these guys went off to do other things. And what happened in Colorado? Gold in 1859, right? That was the, that was the big game changer that, that brought folks out from other parts of the U.S. Remember, we'd had the 49ers who had gone to California, figured it out there, played out that. You know, the folks who got the early claims, they did great. And so, of course, we had the, the, the Clear Creek finding there in the Denver area, and, and they went upstream from there. Now, the gold miners 
absolutely affected both our streams and our laws around Colorado water. Now the Poudre clearly wasn't a big gold stream though, was it? I mean, they, they came up and they looked around, but you don't see the kind of gold mines right up and down the river like you do when you go up I-70 and you're going through Georgetown and places like that. It just wasn't that great. Where was our major gold camp in this area? Manhattan, right? Anybody been up there to the Manhattan? Uh? Yes? Yeah, the big town of Manhattan. So really it wasn't a, a, a rich gold strike, but what happened when the miners came in, they, they used placer techniques, right, where they needed to divert water from the river in order to work their ore, right? That's the way they did it. And so they were the original big diverters on our streams in Colorado. And, you know, they had this idea on the claim, right? You'd make a claim, first in time, first in right on making that claim, and you had to work your claim in order to keep your claim. And what you find is those ideas transferred to Colorado water as well. The idea of first in time, first in right, you have to work it to keep it. You, if it's abandoned, then somebody else can get it. Reagan, and so, I gave everybody a one-page okay. overview of, of that uh, whole business about coming water off. Okay, very good. So the miners began to really change our rivers in the way that we thought about water. And what did they do besides that? I mean, the really big thing that happened, most of the miners didn't end up being rich miners, right? They ended up in the saloons and then, you know, doing, doing other things. And so what really happened in 1859, um, there was a guy by the name of Wall. I think he was from Illinois. He was actually on Clear Creek. And he, he realized, man, this mining is hard work. But I'm a farm kid, and I know how to farm. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise vegetables for those miners. And so that began the idea of diverting water for agriculture on the Front Range. And at 1859 is really when we see the first diversions on our rivers and stream in Colorado that's sort of pre-Spanish. So down the, the oldest water right in Colorado that's still being worked is actually 1852 in the San Luis Valley on the Conejos, but again, that was part of the old Spanish land grants and a, a completely different system. So what began to happen, starting in 1859 and going from there, was the development of agriculture. That was the economy, right? That's what people knew how to do. So as mining, trapping is pretty much gone, servicing the miners, and then beginning this development of agriculture. And so the, the original settlers to the valley that we're going to settle and stay, in other words, not just moving through hunting or trapping or something like this, came into farm and, and to raise cattle. And so the early homesteads around Fort Collins, we've got some pretty good documentation of those. And they came in and they brought their crops and their seed from the Midwest, right? And they were raising what you'd expect, wheat, barley, potatoes. Back in those days, a lot of your land had to go to raising feed for your livestock. So, you know, Oats used to be the biggest grain crop in the U.S. Why? Because horses, right? It was all horsepower. And so what you'd also do is you'd grow oats and hay and alfalfa, so we had a lot of that. We had orchards that came in with these folks, planting those orchards as well. Um, and, you know, Laporte and others grew as trading centers for farmers to bring their stuff in, buy staple goods, go out, and so that's how these towns began to develop. And one of the interesting things about Fort Collins that you don't see now is that this was a major sheep growing area. We were big on sheep and um, CSU started researching this idea of sugar beets in the 1880s as a potential crop for this area and it started to catch on and part of what happened is the Sugar beets were a tremendously labor-intensive crop, but the tops of the beets were fed to the she sheep. And so we started this sort of economy of feeding sheep. And actually, Well County is still number one county in the U.S. for sheep on feed. So it, it persists, but not like it did back in the day. Yes, sir? Didn't you say they were raising the, the sugar beets for feed? No, it was, it was alternative. I, so... The tops, you know, are no good in the sugar process, so the, the beet was the cash crop. But uh, beets and sheep kind of evolved together in this area. And one of the things as water developed, you know, when you fly into this area or fly over it, you see all of these little reservoirs up and down the Front Range. You guys have seen those? 
Most of those were built starting 1890s to 1900, and the reason they figured out the sugar, so sugar beets really got going about that time, uh, 1890s, but it's a long season crop, and they needed water to finish out the beets at the end of the season, and by then the river was played out, right? By August, there was very little uh, water in the river, and so a lot of these reservoirs up and down the Front Range were originally beat for, built for sugar beets. Look at that picture down in the bottom. That was in Fort Collins. Who knows where that was? Yeah, kind of still, right? And if you're on the trail there, what's on the other side of the bike trail across from where the sugar beet plant used to be down there? Well, a little further down, what I'm thinking of are those huge, that the lime dumps, the, right on the other side where there's nothing but uh, kosher weeds will grow. So, you know, they used a lot of lime to extract the sugars back in those days, and you can still see this in any of the sugar beet plants around Colorado. The one at Longmont, you see it, and uh, Greeley with these big lime dumps. And you can see it across the river there uh, in Fort Collins where our old sugar beet plant used to be. There's only one sugar beet plant left in, Fort, in Colorado now. Anybody know where it is? Fort Moore? Yeah, good. You guys are highly educated. All the others are gone. So everybody, any beets you see growing, they all have to haul them out to, to Fort Morgan. Okay, so Camp Collins, you guys know all about Camp Collins. The reason I throw Camp Collins in when we're talking about Poudre is it tells us something about that river. And that is, and it took us a while to learn this, right? We had to learn it the hard way in Denver in 1864, right? We know what happened in 1864 in Denver, right? The, and the Arapaho told them, hey, don't build there. And they did anyway, right? And it totally flooded. Well, same thing for us. You know, these look like, these mountain streams look pretty tame until they're not tame, just like what happened last September with the flood. And, of course, Camp Collins moved, moved it to uh, current uh, Fort Collins. And, yeah, Joseph Mason, I threw this in. They started look after the 1864 flood. Um, so it started in 1862, flooded in 1864. And then Mason apparently was here, credited with being Fort Collins' first white settler. I don't know if you guys have talked about Mason or not. Uh, he helped them find the new, the new site. I think that's actually a picture of the new, not the old site. Okay, so now let's talk about something I know more about, which is water development. So the, the way things developed in the Poudre uh, Valley is not very much different than the Vrain or the, the St. Vrain or the Thompson or any of the tributaries of the Platte or the Arkansas or for that matter the Colorado River system and that is folks would come in, they tend to be near the river, that was the best lands, right, those bottom lands near the river. You'd build your own, you and your sons and your, you know, whoever, you'd build your own little ditch and try to water a patch of land. And they figured out pretty quickly that, you know, a man and a couple of sons couldn't really get the job done, right? It's, it was a much bigger job to build these irrigation ditches and to control that water. By the way, there weren't any engineering schools or classes in hydraulics, right? These folks had to just figure it out, and there was lots of failures. So lots of ditches, were small ditches, began to be constructed in the 1860s. And, you know, in Fort Collins, the Jaeger, Watrous, Wedby, Secor, and Coy. Those were the first ditches, and most of those are just were right in, you know, between City Park and, and downtown Fort Collins. Very close there uh, is where those guys were developing the original uh, irrigation in Fort Collins. And, and it was manpower and horsepower, but what began to happen pretty quickly, and, you know, obviously when you're building a ditch that big, you're, you're undertaking a pretty good uh, uh, job there is folks began to organize and water is really a very social thing I mean you've got to have people working together or they're working against each other and this is when things really began to develop in water in Colorado as we began more of these community ditches and so you guys know about the colony movement that started so in the right so in the uh, 1860s and 70s there must have been some thinking back in the Midwest and the East about uh, s sort of this idea of utopian colonies and getting together as groups and moving out West. And remember we had Horace Greeley telling people to go West, young man. And, and so 
there began this idea of colonies. And so our first one was the, the Mercer Colony, and that was about out there in the city park area. Didn't, it didn't catch on, apparently. There's a new Mercer Ditch, but that was new, not the original colony. That one didn't stick. The Union Colony was the one, of course, that Horace Greeley and Nathan Meeker uh, settled over there in the Greeley area, right? That was a temperance colony. They were looking for men of good character that didn't want to drink, that wanted to work hard and come out there and develop uh, the water out there at the end of the pooter, right? So they were on the Cashla pooter, but on the other end of where we are. Fort Collins Colony was a little bit different. And it, as I understand it, and if somebody knows more about it here, correct me, but they really came out to settle this place. They really weren't so much about, I mean, I think they might have allowed a little cider or something like that. It wasn't a, a temperance deal. It was more about how do we get this place settled because we have this community and we have this ag college. Remember, CSU started 1870 also, right? We didn't start classes till 1879, I believe, was when our first class was. But the, the university was founded then. And the Fort Collins colony came out. But the significance is the colony started digging ditches off the pooter. And when you got these colonies, you had a lot bigger ditches. So you had the Union colonists down there in Greeley digging their canals. And then you had these folks up in Fort Collins digging their canals. And so remember, 1864 was the flood that wiped out Denver and, and Camp Collins, et cetera. 1874 was a really hot, dry summer. It was a drought. And it's, a, it's an important date because what happened so they had, uh, Greeley had its union, they had their canal number two going, they were irrigating, they were developing their farms. Midsummer, the canal dried, you know, the river dried up. Have you guys heard this story? So the river dried up, and they're like, what in the heck? And uh, they go upstream, and there are those Fort Collins colonists that have finished the Larimer Canal number two, Ben Eaton was involved in that, and the Lake Canal, and they were draining the river. And so, the, so they called for a meeting, and they met at what, the Eaton Schoolhouse, apparently. Um, and it was hot, and these guys, remember, these were Civil War veterans, you know, with one arm, and they had been through battle, and they were battle-hardened guys. And, and, you know, the stories are great that you read about it. Tempers flared. People called for their, you know, go to your guns, men. Let's settle this like Civil War veterans. And, you know, basically the Greeley folks were saying, hey, we got here first. And the Fort Collins were say, people were saying, we don't care. We're up River of you. You know, <laughs> what, what's the argument here? And remember, they came from the East Coast where the, the basis was riparian rights, right? And repairing rights says if you're near the river, if you're on the side of the bank of the river, you have the right to divert it. Your diversion has to be de minimis. In other words, you can't affect anybody else. But remember, you're thinking eastern mentality, big rivers, etc. And so they had come with this idea of repairing rights out to the west, and they found out really quickly it wasn't going to work. Okay, and this was the beginning. And what ended up happening actually. Shortly after the meeting at the Eaton Schoolhouse, when they were mad and wanted to get after each other, it started raining. And it ra they had a long, good spell of wet weather. People cooled off and said, let's talk about this and, and figure it out. So this is 1874. And 1876, we become a state. And written into the Constitution, the Colorado Constitution, is this really important idea that the right to divert unappropriated water uh, cannot be denied. Also, the water is owned by the people of, for, of Colorado. Okay, You can have a right to use it, and your right uh, was based upon this idea of prior appropriation. So sometime between 1874 and 1876, people had come together and realized that they needed a priority system. There wasn't going to be enough water in our rivers out here in the West, and so there had to be some way to allocate shortage and that's really there's two ideas about what we actually did with the, with the system that we adopted in Colorado one was did I go back um, one was this idea of priority and the other was that hey you know if the people who live along the river can hold up all the water and the land 
Nobody else can get it. And that's not going to work because cattle barons and rich people from the east can get a monopoly on the water. And so one of the, one of the thoughts in sort of modern scholarship as people look at this is a lot of this was about sort of the, the, the agrarian movement and the anti-capitalist movement and making water available to anybody who wants to appropriate it. And you didn't have to be just there on the river was the idea uh, that's come out. So, you know, Colorado, remember, we were part of this Kansas territory, right? And actually, if you look at where the state boundaries are now, we were sort of carved out of the Nebraska, the Kansas, Utah, and New Mexico territories. Have you guys talked about why it's just this square box sitting there in the middle of those territories? It's easy. Oh, you did just start? I just started last week. Oh, I thought you guys were like advanced students or no. something. This was like the graduate <laughs> course. Okay. Um, so it's not just that it's really easy to draw. And yes, we were fixated on the idea of, you know, the, the grid system that Jefferson put in in carving out the Louisiana Purchase. But uh, according to some scholars, what they were trying to achieve with the way that they drew these boundaries is they wanted to completely get the minerals. Now remember, this is, um, it, we were trying to get through the slave period, right? I mean, figuring out what were free states and slave states also, so that was a big part of it, trying to create it. But they wanted to put a box around the goal because that's what they were focused on at the time. And so um, some people think that's the reason that it's carved out like it is out of, out of those territories. But the important thing from this point of this discussion is really what we did in our Constitution and how that has guided us all the way through. Yes, sir? Is Fort Collins in the Nebraska territory? Looks like it was, doesn't it? I don't know how good this map is. I found this, but it kind of does look like it was right on the, the, uh, the edge of that when they carved it out. So the, the interesting thing, of course, is John Wesley Powell, of course, you know, when he went out and did his run down the river in the, what, 1870s, and he went back and did his report, he said, man, you better organize those states by watershed. If you don't, you're going to have trouble down the road. And, and we did not listen to him, and he was right. And so Colorado is, you know, this crazy square state of ours. We got four big river systems that go downstream, right? I mean, we got the Platte, the Arkansas, the Rio Grande, and the Colorado system coming out. And the fact that we're this headwaters state, and all the water goes downhill, is part of why water is so complicated and contentious in Colorado. There's 18 states in Mexico downstream. They all want their water, and we have to deliver it. And so one of the things that people don't understand is that we have to deliver two-thirds of our rivers downstream. We get to live on one-third of the water that's in our rivers in Colorado. I wasn't going to talk about compacts, but it's a really important part of sort of how water works in Colorado. And it's, we, can, we can do questions, but I want to get through and let George talk. So I mentioned the, the idea of the riparian system and how they had brought that, and, the, and we came up with this idea. It really started in California with the miners out there. They propagated it here, but this sort of first in time, first in right. You didn't have to be on the system. You could be remote. We, early court cases figured out you could move through people's property to move your water along ditches and conveyances, and you couldn't block that from happening. Not only that, water had to be put to a beneficial use. That's written right into our doctrine, and a beneficial use in those days was drinking water first, and the Constitution states this, ag second, industry third. That hierarchy is written into our Constitution. And people always wonder when push comes to shove, how's that going to play out? Are we really going to invoke that, those, that hierarchy in the way that we administer water? There's been some court cases about it, and we, I can talk more about it. But the other important thing in our system is that water rights are transferable. So the, just really briefly to set George up, the way Ag water rights work are really important to understanding how breweries and industries and cities water rights work. And that is that in 1870, 60, whatever, and maybe still today, ag was very inefficient in the way that it irrigated, right? It would divert and, you know, they didn't, the earliest CSU studies, the first ag experiment station study at CSU was trying to figure out how much water do we need to put on these crops? So folks were applying for water rights, and a water right in Colorado is a point of diversion, 
a flow rate, not an amount, a flow rate. So usually it's in so many CFS, cubic feet per second, for a use. So you got a place, an amount, and a use is the way a water right looks, okay, still today when you get a water right. That's, that's what they look like. But an ag water right, you've got a diversion that's going to be, in most cases, a lot more than what the crop consumptively uses. And what happens is, because of that inefficiency, you're pushing out flood irrigation, you're going to have water percolating below the root zone, and you're going to have water running off as you have water that returns back to the stream, okay? So most of the early water rights were ag water rights. They worked like this, and what happened in Colorado is we developed a system to where the next guy down here would make his appropriation based upon what we call that return flow. Okay, and this is really important to understanding what hap what, what's transpired in Colorado as we've gone further. A, if you want to change a water right in Colorado, so if you want to, if you want to buy George's ag right for a use other than ag, all you get is this what we call consumptive use fraction. And you have to leave the stream in the condition that you found it. In other words, you'll have to put those return flows back in so that next water right user downstream enjoys the stream conditions at the time of their appropriation. I don't know if that makes sense, but that concept is really important to understanding Colorado water and, and what is happening as we have developed into a more and more urbanized society. And I can talk more about it, but I want to I want to kind of move on. Thought I ought to mention Fort Collins just a little bit more since we're thinking about our history. What are we looking at there? The yeah, the old waterworks. So, you know, uh, what, what we can tell is that Prior to 1883, basically, you dipped water out of the irrigation canal that ran through the city, or there were these water wagons. And what happened is there was a couple of big fires in Fort Collins. There was one, I think, in 1880 that burned down uh, uh, an important store downtown. And then there was this whole Keystone Block fire in 1882. And so what the town fathers realized was that we need a pressurized system, so we put these dang fires out. And by the way, hey, that would bring safe drinking water and would upgrade everything. So 1883, we built our first waterworks system there in Fort Collins, uh, right up there near Lions Park, right off of Overland. You guys know where, all know where that is. And there's a move afoot to work on that right now and do some, some cool stuff. And then uh, we moved up to where the North Fork and the Cache Laputer and built another plant there in 1905. But, you know, there was the concern about disease, and we had some disease outbreaks in this hauled water, and then there was the fire concerns. And so the interesting thing is, when an engineer designs a city water system and the pipes, the pipe sizing and the pressure is about fire protection. That's the first thing that you've got to do, is you've got to have enough water for the fire hydrants. So, anyway, so we finally got a sewer system in the late 1880s. Um, and the thing about Fort Collins that you can really feel good about is they got busy and got some very senior, they got the most senior water rights on the Cache Laputer. They're in really great shape for water. We had forefathers here. And what you're seeing now play out is the new towns out there east of I-25 the, that came along later that have mainly subsisted on wells because they've been very small, but now you see that they're growing like crazy. They don't have these kind of water rights, and this is a real tension, and we'll get to this in a minute. And so remember, first in time, first in right. So a city needs a very senior water right. Fort Collins is in great shape, but Erie and Johnstown and Alt and those towns out there that all want to grow, not so much. Yes, sir. How was that water treated in those early days? Yeah. In terms of purity? Yeah. So they used basically settling and sand filters. And so the, um, it, it wasn't great. Okay. But it was better than hauling it in a bucket that a horse had drunk out of. So, you know, the, the idea of chlorination came on later. And I can't tell you exactly when. But, you know, the, the basic game was you, you'd get your intake above your city so that you didn't have the effluent downstream. And, you know, Fort Collins didn't actually have advanced wastewater treatment until like 1948 or something. I mean, so, yeah, and, you know, so the downstream, yeah, it was always more problematic being downstream than upstream in terms of, 
uh, good helpful water, but it was basically settling in sand filters were the main treatment techniques that they had. Let me jump to the pooter and I'm going to talk, set, try to set the stage for George talking just a little bit about this river that's our watershed and that uh, you know we really care about and that and sort of we developed here right in the Cache La Poudre, uh Basin and the pooter is a really interesting system. It's a headwaters river comes off a of Rocky Mountain National Park right up there at the Continental Divide at, at Milner Pass is where our headwaters are, comes down through uh, the park and to the main stem, but it's a highly man manipulated and engineered system. And um, above the mouth of the canyon, it's also highly manipulated and engineered. You, it just doesn't look like it as much. And by that, what I mean is you've got a lot of water coming into this system that's not na what we call native water. Okay, you've got trans mountain water. All right, and so the, the, the Colorado Big Thompson project is the biggest of those, but our watershed is really a pretty crazy watershed because we've got the, you know, we got the North Fork, we got the main stem, we got the Big South Fork and the Little South Fork. Those are the main tributaries, but you've got these inputs: the Laramie River Tunnel bringing water from the Laramie. You've got the Michigan Ditch bringing really North Platte water in. You've got the Grand Ditch bringing in. Colorado River water, and then the big one, Colorado Big Thompson. Wow, that's touchy, isn't it, George? Tunnel under. Especially if you touch it. Yeah, especially if you touch it. Big Thompson uh, project bringing in a whole bunch of water that, of course, comes to horse tooth and then dumps into the pooter. And so the hydrology of the pooter, it's just really different. And one of the great things about having water from these other basins into our system is a lot of times the way, in Colorado there's a drought somewhere every year, but a lot of times it'll be on the east side or the west side or the south slope or the north slope, and so you really build a lot of redundancy into a system when you have these trans mountain diversions, okay? And a lot of this water from the CBT project, of course, goes on down the plat, the Colorado Big Thompson project. And that was an amazing project that really some folks in Greeley figured out and worked really hard for it, changed Colorado water totally, but it was back in the 30s, was dry, they realized they had already completely appropriated the Platte River, and they knew they needed more water, and hey, the Colorado River was sitting over there, ripe for the picking, it just took millions of dollars in engineering and uh, a lot of political will to get that project built, and they did. So here's the important thing. George. Just uh, a real important part of the, what Ray is talking about is the fact that that's called foreign water because you don't have any junior rights filed on it downstream, so you don't have to worry about the return flows. And so everybody's real hot for that water because it solves a lot of problems for them if they want to use it for municipal or other uh, it's, power plants. It's planner. 100% usable. And there's not a return flow obligation. So trans basin water or developed water is good stuff. CBT water has a very strange, so in most cases you can read, so, I mean, for example, Laramie Tunnel water, you can use it to extinction, and that's the case of almost all trans basin water except CBT water, which you only have one use on. So in Colorado, we have a single use water for all of our in basin water. So you only get one use at it, and that's, the, that's why we have the problems with gray water and water reuse and some of the things that are adopted in other states. CBT water also has that one use rule, so it, it, it's really interesting. But when you look at the flows, you know, the native flow of the Poudre is about 300,000 acre feet, and you can see CBT adds a big chunk to that, and so does the uh, other uh, basin trans, uh, trans mountain uh, diversions there, trans basin imports. And so, um, important. So, 65% of it in the water, the native flow is snow melt. And I think the other thing, and I'm not going to belabor this, is one of the fundamental things about western water is that it's highly variable. If you're a water manager, average doesn't mean anything. You don't care. I mean, it's great. It's how you can plan, but drought is what drives us crazy out here because we can go from really great flows on the Cache La Poudre, 700,000 acre feet to flows way down here like we had in 2002 and others where uh, 
super low flows. And so this is one of the issues that you have to deal with in western water. And the other one that's really fascinating is because it's a snowmelt driven system, this is how the hydrograph of a river, this is sort of stylized, but Pooter and these native flows without transbasin water, really low flows, right? Snow melt, really low flows. Well, if you're living in a place like this, so people in Fort Collins, you know, you hear people don't like reservoirs, no reservoirs, right? We can talk about that later. Problem is, all good May through August. But the rest of the year, it's really difficult. You've got to have a way to even out those flows in the West. And this is true all over the West. It's actually true in the East, but probably more so out here. So you have this really crazy year-to-year -year variation, and then you have the way these river flows. And those two things have driven the way that we've developed our water supplies in the West. I'm going to keep moving here, George, just to get it to you. Um, Fort Collins, as I mentioned, or Poudre River, lots of little bitty reservoirs and a few big ones. City of Fort Collins, so one of the things people don't really understand about Fort Collins is that we think of Horsetooth as being our water, but it's not our reservoir, right? This is not the city of Fort Collins' reservoir. It's the CBT Project's reservoir. Now, we own some water rights there, but the only storage that uh, the city of Fort Collins has is about 6,000 acre feet up in Joe Wright that we purchased back in the 90s. And we've got water rights in other systems. And we're trying to raise the Halligan Reservoir right, the city of Fort Collins is. And of course, Seaman is Greeley's Reservoir. And there's a lot of little ones, but those are the, the biggies right there. OK. CBT project, a big deal for this basin. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. All these other Trans Mountain diversions. Um, have you guys, so you know where the Laramie Tunnel is? You all have seen that when you're driving up the Pooter to your right as you get up pretty high in the system. These other ditches like Michigan Ditch, you all know where that is as you get up to Cameron Pass. Um, the Grand Ditch you can see as you're coming, um, well you can see it in Rocky Mountain up there, but Amazing. I mean, you think about these were built. Grand was one of the earliest ones built in the 1890s. I guess you had all these miners that knew how to move rock and blow up rock, and by golly, they did it. But these were amazing uh, structures that were built around the turn of the 20th century. There's the list of them. Yeah, there's the Michigan, Laramie Tunnel. So who owns this and uses this water? That's what I want to get to to set up George and move on. So George and I debated this a little bit by email, and there's the issue of who owns the water in the pooter and who uses the water in the pooter. And this is a, a moving target, and it's a little hard to get your hands around. But in terms of ag, we've got four really big ditches in this system taking water off the cache of the pooter once you get below the, no, uh, the mouth of the river. But the uh, north pooter actually pulls out even below the mouth of the canyon. North Pooter Irrigation Company, Water Supply and Storage, huge company, Larimer and Weld, and then the New Cache. So those are the four really big ones. And George has a map that I pulled out of my slides that he'll show you. And then you've got the municipalities, the city of Fort Collins. Greeley, of course, has their drinking water off the Pooter also, right? The Union Colony came up here early and got water off the Pooter. And they have their treatment plant, right? You guys know where that is? Right near Watson Lake is where Greeley has its water treatment plant. And then right next to City of Fort Collins' treatment plant, below Soldier Canyon there. So if you go, what, all the way up Laporte Avenue to, yeah, I think it's all the way up Laporte to, to the foothills, you'll see on one side Fort Collins' treatment plant, and then behind that is the Soldier Canyon filter plant. And that's for the so-called tri-districts. Do you guys know about the, the tri-districts? So, City of Fort Collins utility does not service most of the, uh, all of the water in the city of Fort Collins. And there are these water districts. And there's three big ones, Fort Collins Loveland, Elko, and then North Weld. So all of the growth, city of Fort Collins' utility has pretty much uh, hit uh, build out. Okay? So all the growth that you're seeing to the east and the south is uh, managed by these tri-districts. 
reason this is kind of interesting and, and I think important for the dialogue that we're having here in Fort Collins is the Northern District is trying to build the NISP project, right, Glade Reservoir. City of Fort Collins is um, opposed or oppositional to that for some reasons we can talk about. And one thing you hear people saying is that the City of Fort Collins will not benefit from Glade Reservoir. Strictly speaking, if you're speaking of the City of Fort Collins utility, that's correct. But you've got a whole bunch of citizens of Fort Collins and surrounding area that are part of that project and who are looking for that water for their growth. And so just wanted to clarify that, that point. I'm going to move on. This is a pretty interesting map. It didn't come out that well on your slides, but you have like, I don't know the exact number, it's 13 or 15 major irrigation diversions and diversions from when you come out of the mouth through the city. And that's why the river through the city, you know, it's kind of a canal, right? I mean, it's not, it doesn't exactly work like a, a free-flowing western river because there are so many diversions upstream and, of course, the old ones that come in. A lot of our growth has been out over those ditches and those ag areas, and so a lot of that water has come into the city of Fort Collins' portfolio. As we've built onto irrigated agricultural land, that water comes in and it becomes part of what the city has to work with. But the Pooter is what we call a working river. Highly diverted, highly manipulated. Um, humans use it to do what they do, which is raise crops and have city life and, and have beer, Anheuser-Busch. And so th this is the tension that you feel in this community about recreation and environmental values versus sort of that, that working river and how the system has developed over 150 years. Okay, so here I, I'm going to get to my, my wrap up here, and that is that a lot of things have, have affected this river system from the very beginning. And we talked about beaver trapping and mining, logging. What do you think? This is a picture on the pooter. What do you think those tie drives did to a river system? Did they affect it? Yeah, of course they did. And, and what do you think? I mean, as you look at our rivers, the Big Thompson and the Vrain and the Pooter, putting a road right along the river is great, scenic, right? But it affects the ability of the river to access its floodplain and act like a natural river. And so we've done a lot of things to change the way that our rivers work out here in the West. That's reality. And so, the, so looking back to, you know, a pre-1860 river and thinking that's what we could have, is not going to happen, but the question is what should we have, what can we have given what, what, where we are. And so a lot of the really interesting stuff that's happened in the last 40 or so years is, is what I call new values and new beneficial uses. You know, human values have changed. And beginning in the Nixon administration when we put in the Clean Water Act and NEPA and we began to pass all those environmental laws back in the 70s, things really did begin to change. And in, Colorado in 1973 began this idea of in-stream flow protection and making that a beneficial use. That was never a beneficial use before. Water for the environment being a beneficial use. Um, Pooter is a wild and scenic river, the only one in Colorado right now. Got that designation in 86. Um, and this came out of a negotiation that some of you all were here. I know the earlier talks about damming the Pooter. Remember the earlier groups? The, um, before the one that we have now, Friends of the Pooter and whatnot. And so uh, there was going to be a large on-channel dam on the Pooter. Um, Northern District was going to do that. Big discussion with the environmental community. Uh, they made a compromise back in, in the 80s with the environmental community, reserved the right to have a dam on the main channel in the lower part of the river, and got this this designation of wild and scenic for the rest of the river, which essentially took away the option of damming the upper part of the Cache Laputa River. Then we started this, this in -channel, recreational in-channel diversion thing in Colorado around 2001. What's that? Kayak parks, saying that's a beneficial use. In other words, you're not taking, so this is a huge mindset because we always thought about water beneficial use being consumptive use, using it for beer or crops or whatnot. The idea of Water in the river being a beneficial use has been a very difficult thing to take forward in Colorado. Yes, sir? What's the dividing line between the upper and the lower? 
um, in terms of the agreement on, it's Where, like, the wild yeah, I think it starts about five miles from the uh, Kenyan mouth. So they left, do you know the exact, it's somewhere in the five to seven miles. They left, see, so Northern had this water right. They had two big water rights on the river, um, the Idlewild and the Gray Rock right. So they left that very bottom part, potentially. Now, is it going to happen? Mm. Look how hard it's been to, to build Glade, which is off channel. But they left that possibility in the earlier negotiation. And the current environmental groups in the community don't really recognize that they made that agreement. Do you know what I'm saying? So the environmental groups that negotiated the agreement in the 80s, those folks are gone. Some pretty significant Fort Collins people were involved in that. Um, uh, I, I, I testified before the House Natural Resources Committee trying to reconcile the difference between ag and environment when that was mm -hmm. actually agreed upon. So yeah. it was an agreement. The thing in Colorado is the only group that can hold it in, in stream flow right is the Colorado Water Conservation Board. They have four on the Cache La Poudre. They have hundreds around Colorado. The recreational was you had to go in, and by the way, Fort Collins pioneered this idea and it's propagated, but you had to go in and make some change to the riverbed to build a kayak park or something, and the water that was needed for the hydraulics to make that system work could be filed on as a water right. Very contentious issue. The water management community in Colorado fought hard against this because they saw bad things happening. But it's actually worked out pretty good. And you see in Golden and Vail, uh, Steamboat, lots of recreation around these parks. Color Fort Collins, driving north on College Avenue, uh, power plant, old power plant, and now the CSU's Energy Institute. Look right down river as you're going north on College, the bridge, and you're going to see where the Cory Ditch structure is, and then you'll see some things in the river. So Fort Collins has. Not a recreational, but they started it with this idea of an in-channel diversion. And Fort Collins has those water rights, and they've been through water court and litigated all the way up and through. So what, this is really environmental. This is really recreational. Maybe it's the simple answer. But the idea is it's not consumptive. The water it's, stays it's in the river. It's moving the channel. No, well, usually they just put some Shaping rocks the in flow. The yeah, they shape the flow. They throw some rocks in. Etc. but they don't consumptively use the water or take it out of the channel. And then 2009, uh, Poudre got this designation as a natural heritage area as well. George, I'm trying to wrap up. So I was, I was building all this to Glade Reservoir. So we talked about this idea of a, uh, a, a, res a big on-channel reservoir in the Cache La Poudre. Really hard to do for environmental reasons now to build an on-channel reservoir. And so the thinking in the water community is, okay, can't dam up the river canyon because people value the river canyon for all sorts of reasons. We'll go off, off canyon. We'll go off channel and build a reservoir. And that's really what Glade is, is proposing there. And so you can see 287, uh, Graves' place here. Um, this is what would be flooded. The dam, I think, would go across here, here. And so mm -hmm. the reservoir will come up like that, that Northern is proposing. Highly controversial. Um, we're in the middle of the EIS, pro the Environmental Impact Statement process on this reservoir. We're expecting what they call the supplemental to come out early in 2015. And then it's going to get really interesting in Fort Collins when that happens, because I think that's when the, the uh, when it starts to get, get quite interesting. But the, the point I was trying to make earlier is a lot of the participants for that reservoir, they're not Fort Collins. They're not Greeley. They're not Loveland. <clears throat> they're these little cities off to the east, Severance, Lafayette, Firestone, Frederick, Dakota, Eaton. Newcomers, they'd always just had town wells. That's how they got their water. But when you see the growth, it's not going to work. So these folks have to get water somewhere. It's going to happen. And that's my segue to George. George, how's it going to happen? How are these people going to get their water? Your turn. I'm going to talk a little bit about how these water issues 
are transforming our landscape. Uh, just as Reagan did a wonderful job of showing you how incredibly uh, influential the use of water has been on the landscape you see here now. Um, the Larimer County Master Plan calls for us to minimize the loss of ag land and water. But it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Water is, uh, the pressure on water is relentless. Uh, those of us that own ag water, we almost monthly receive phone calls, cards from water speculators who want to buy our water and for Denver suburbs largely. Uh, and they want to give us a lot of money for it. Um, commodity prices fluctuate. Many producers are approaching retirement. And by the way, excuse me, I want to introduce a very special guest. Uh, and Liz Harrison, who is sitting quietly over here on the side, is from the Bee family. Her father was Francis, right? And they have many generations on a Larimer County farm, they're a centennial farm, they have the Bee Museum. And I want to ask Liz to weigh in on some of these issues and questions at the end, give her a few minutes. And she also uh, has some, some uh, brochures about the Bee Museum. If you haven't been there, you should, because it really relates very closely to what we're talking about today. Anyway, uh, the, uh, a lot of producers are approaching retirement. And uh, there's a lot of pressure on water. Sometimes egg prices are good and, and people are, are willing to resist that pressure and the amount of money that they're being offered. And other times, like in the 70s and 80s, commodity prices were low and the pressure was high and a lot of water moved to urban uh, ownership of urban water providers. So before I talk about, uh, some of us are thinking about alternatives to this concept of buy and dry. Buy and dry has been the main uh, and, and uh, <coughs> construction of infrastructure and, and buy and dry have been the main ways that cities have gotten water. You go out and buy egg water. In fact, if you're a developer, you're, you're almost required to go out and find the water that you need for the development you're proposing. So, uh, in the past, we've depended a lot, and a lot of us are starting to think about the wisdom of continuing to use buy and dry as the main way we get water for, uh, and that was Reagan's last question, how, how are these towns going to get their, their water? So I passed that map around, and Reagan showed you part of uh, this system, this incredible system that was built early on by uh, people that had a lot of foresight and worked tremendously hard um, and under incredible conditions. If you, if you ever hiked in the Rywa Wilderness up on Camp Ditch Trail, you'll see those high mountain ditches at 11,000 feet that were part of the diversion of the Laramie River water back through the Poudre Tunnel. And Wyoming had to stop because Colorado filed suit. And you, that's why you go up and see the if you know, if you've hiked in the woods, you find the old abandoned camps where the guys that were building those ditches uh, had their kitchens and their hundred mules and so forth. But anyway, it's an incredible system. Uh, this map, of course, is that one I passed you around. It's 1906. There was no road up the Poudre Canyon at that time, but yet all these reservoirs have been built. None of them were natural lakes. If you fly over, you'd think, wow, this is like Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> it was all done with the guys and horses and mules and slips. And it's just absolutely incredible. I've got one of those reservoirs um, on our farm. And uh, um, one of those lakes is called Bee Lake. And uh, I'm going to ask Liz to tell us how we got the name of that reservoir named after her family. I'm sure that's an interesting story. The early residents understood the value of water, and they were willing to put effort and money into uh, the infrastructure that was needed to take water from the few places that ran naturally to the places where it could be used for a lot of other things. <laughs> this is a view of uh, kind of the current irrigated acreages that we have in Larimer and Weld. Um, and some of the crops that are, are being grown with that water. 
and this is Fort Collins, and this is Greeley, and you can sort of just imagine straws reaching out into that landscape and sipping water that is needed, and we're, we're slowly seeing uh, um, quite a bit of, uh, not as much dry up in, in Weld County, but certainly some, we've all experienced dry up in uh, Larimer County. You can, there are a number of farms that have been purchased, water rights have been purchased and have been dried up. <clears throat> um, an alternative scenario is that we devise a method by which some water can move back and forth. And I'm going to plant that, uh, all, some of the alternative ways that that might happen so that we can maintain an irrigated landscape at the same time we're providing for par part of the water uh, needs that urban areas have. Unlike uh, a lot of places, we don't have a lot of corporate farming. We have mostly farm families here that have been here a long time, and the bee family will be a wonderful example of this incredible uh, intergenerational knowledge base that we stand to lose if we lose an irrigated landscape. Um, I would like to just do what we did it as an ag board when we started to talk about this issue. We went to the public and we tried to remind people all of the, we talk about beneficial use of water, we wanted to remind people of some of the benefits that are associated with an irrigated landscape like this one. Come on. Um, We've got a list, and then I'm going to, after I go through that list, I'm going to dwell on a couple of them in a little more detail. This landscape uh, in, provides locally grown food and fiber, and we, we're seeing an increasing amount of that in the last uh, 10, 15 years. It gives us open space. It separates our communities like uh, Wellington and Fort Collins, uh, to some degree, Loveland and, and Fort Collins. It provides wildlife habit habitat. It gives um, a very robust economic uh, type of activity that is based on renewable resources. Sunlight, soil, carbon dioxide, and water, year after year, produces wealth. It's not every industry we have in town that can say that it can do that. It <coughs> All those reservoirs and canals are, are recharging our groundwater. Um, we, last year, one of the reasons Fort Collins didn't have as much damage from the flooding was because the ag infrastructure and landscape absorbed part of that shock. We were able to put a lot of, we were all asked to take water. And we, we took water down our ditches and wherever we had room and we irrigated when we didn't need to, we recharged the aquifer and uh, we put it into some wetlands. We did a lot of things to, to reduce that surge from the flood. Uh, we're starting to see some ag tourism, um, harvest farm, the bee farm, um, Budweiser, the breweries, all ag related types of tourism. Uh, the hydrograph, what Reagan showed you, was stylized because ideally it, it goes like this during July and August as we release those ag flows for places like Long Draw, uh, to some degree, the Trans Mountain, well, a bit from Joe Ride, a bit from Halligan, a bit from here and there, and it enables your recreation flows to continue longer than they would have had we, were we not releasing a certain amount of ag water. Um, and I'm talking about other basins as well as, as the Poudre where that happens. An intergenerational knowledge base that would be darn tough to replace is on that landscape. We've got cultural diversity. If you go to the Bee Museum, you'll see that um, white Russians from Germany, people from Mexico, Japanese, we have this incredibly rich cultural mixing on this landscape that is part of the story that um, would be nice to see continue. Um, I put this one up here last night because uh, 
It seems like when, anytime we have a drought in the Midwest or California, we still ap appreciate increasingly the ability to take mountain snowmelt water and grow food with it. Um, in the different basins in the West where you can do that. And I think I can't help but think that it's going to become more important and make our overall food production system more robust. Because we have the ability to apply the water and not be dependent on rain fed uh, precipitation as many parts of the Midwest are. And the Southeast, we've started to see more droughts even in the Southeast. Um, the other thing is because we have this incredible infrastructure out there, we do have the potential to share water and we can to some degree think of the ag landscape as a reservoir. A little bit more on uh, the food part of it. You've all seen the uh, increase in farmers markets. There's a lot more people buying local grass-fed beef or local natural beef or local uh, crops of one another. We've got, um, uh, I know among the, my, my hay customers, for example, um, I've seen a lot of people inquiring about uh, buying more things directly from the farm, and we've seen, I think, about an 80% increase in the number of direct sales off of farms in Larimer County. We've got um, uh, the CSAs, we, a lot of literature and discussion about people appreciating knowing where the food comes from and whether it's safe, uh, reducing the carbon footprint. This is somewhat debatable. Sometimes it's still much more efficient to import on a large scale, uh, but in general, it is possible to reduce the carbon footprint of a community, of a food shed, uh, with, uh, if you maintain your, your productivity on that landscape. So, uh, another nice thing about Larimer County is we really can produce a lot of things here. We have a mild climate, we've got a uh, uh, an increasing number of high value crops we didn't used to have. You know, we started out with the sugar beets and with the small grain, uh, with livestock and, and dairy, and, and now we've got a lot more fruit and vegetables, we've got specialty crops, and we have a pretty high degree of integration between the different uh, aspects of the food system. For example, um, Everybody likes, including vegetarians, likes the idea of organic food. But they forget that most of the nutrients for organic food come from confined animal feeding operations, <laughs> uh, like dairies and feedlots. So, and we do, we have, you know, our, uh, we do, my neighbors and myself included, I'm trying to make transition to more compost and manure and, and less commercial fertilizer. Um, we are dependent on places like the, uh, the dairies and the Greeley feedlots and other places in order to do that. And the breweries, for example, are, we're getting the distiller's grains, they're going back to the dairies, okay, as a, as a feed source. And so we have this, this integration that's, that's really important and requires a certain level of agriculture for it to continue, which requires an irrigated inf infrastructure for it to continue. Uh, you can double this. This was 2007, but commodity prices and activity in this area have increased to the point where this is uh, doubled and in Greeley, I think in Weld County, it's close to over a billion dollars in terms of what it provides to the economy. This was a study that was done uh, yeah, 2007 by the USDA in cooperation with local government. The open space the part of it is um, interesting. Notice which, which uh, issue passed by the highest margin in this election. People love their open space and thank goodness because some of the, the techniques and mechanisms for Water sharing I'm talking about will depend on using some of that money to do it. Um, most open space is still protected and managed by private producers. 
Uh, this, that's a scene from my place there. And uh, if I didn't have water and if, if people didn't have water, those places are going to sell and they're probably going to subdivide. So, uh, and then you, you spend millions of dollars more to replace that open space, which we do. I mean, we, we have the millions now that you guys have agreed. To, we, you've extended that for 30 years, basically, 25 plus the four that are left. So we have a good revenue stream to do some of these things that, that are possible. Uh, that landscape provides a certain amount of wildlife habitat. That's a, that's a scene from my, I often have two or 3,000 migratory waterfowl on one of my reservoirs. I have trumpeter swans, I have sandhill cranes, I have white-faced ibises. I have all that stuff. And it's largely, and I have uh, 50 acres of conservation easement on some wetlands where I've got three species of endangered fish. Uh, the, the brassy minnow, the red-bellied dace, and the Iowa darter. And uh, all across this irrigated landscape, you're going to see migratory waterfowl. You're going to see deer and mammals using uh, uh, those areas as well, especially around reservoirs and along canals where you get all that extra wetlands. So when you hear environmental groups talk about, let's, it doesn't matter, let's get some of this ag water and, and make the river healthy, be careful. Because you've got a health, you've got a certain amount of the same kinds of things being provided all across the landscape along different canals, along around different reservoirs and on different farms that you would be able to revive to some degree along the river. There's no free lunch anymore. You, ba you barely touched this thing and it would change. I have to punch it. <laughs> Um, okay, and you asked about some, some data on uh, uh, how, what is this buy and dry? Uh, what are the changes? 85% of the original CBT project was allocated. And remember, when you file on a water right, it's adjudicated for a certain purpose. It's, if it's a native ag water right, it's different than a CBT water right, which was multiple use, and you can use it for either domestic consumption or production. <clears throat> and currently, uh, probably down to 33%. I've got 34%, but this slide is uh, probably a little out of date, is owned by agriculture at this point. Um, it, I are getting two companies. One is the North Puda Company. And <laughs> And of that, of the original 10,000 shares of North Pooter's stock, about 72% of it is now not, no longer in ag ownership. That doesn't mean, however, that all of it has left agriculture. Most of us irrig irrigate with about half water we own and half water we rent. So we're renting back those decrees, that portion of the water that North Pooters, uh, of North Pooter water that is now owned by either the Char Districts, City of Greeley, City of Fort Collins, we're renting that back and we depend on that rental water very much more than we're used to, especially in Larimer County, not as much in Weld County. Uh, but that also is one of the ways you remember this because one of the, th the things that we're going to talk about is uh, can, we, can we provide water to the urban utilities and in return can we ask them to not change those decrees and keep renting them back in, in normal years. So uh, that's one of the concepts. Uh, and at a recent meeting I was at, a dairyman stood up and said, we have to change the way people think about irrigated agriculture, because everybody says, ag's hogging all the water. He says, let's, let's change the conversation. This guy was a dairyman. He says, let's remember that a lot of this water returns to urban areas of milk, meat, grain, vegetables, and so forth. Um, 
And another thing that's commonly said is water transferred from ag will be a main source, the main source of the base supply for urban areas. Well, um, so we're thinking, can we not at least provide drought year security and recovery? And can't we deal with emergencies without changing those decrees? And that's one of the things that we're part of the conversation that we'd like to change. Uh, and the utilities would say we have to have buy and dry because that's the only way it's secure. So one of the challenges is can we develop secure long-term agreements that give the water providers the, the confidence that it is a legitimate part of the supply so they can sleep at night? Because those guys don't sleep at night if they think about somebody who can turn on their tap and no water comes out. Uh, and of course, yeah, well, Larimer County, I, I remember in the late 80s, people said, ag is dead in Larimer County. That's all right. We get our, plenty of places to get our food from. And again, there's this whole kind of everywhere you look discussion about wouldn't it be nice if we could maintain a food shed and, and, and buy locally and produce locally, even though truth is a lot of what we produce locally is, goes into the larger national ag system. <clears throat> but... To some degree, people uh, uh, are, are, you're not going to see that concept go away. Okay, irrigated farm stake, farm, uh, landscape can be considered a reservoir. We, we, once we uh, started talking about this kind of thing with the public, we realized at the state level there was money to pursue the concept. So we put together a working, our ag board took the lead and we put together a working group and one of, uh, well, the major irrigation companies that Reagan listed are, are participating, North Poudre, Larimer Weld, Water Supply and Storage, New Cash. Uh, the big ditches, the big, comp big irrigators are participating as are the City of Fort Collins, Greeley, and the Tri-Districts. We've got um, some consultants working with us on uh, putting together, helping us put together a database. Uh, we've got uh, a legal counsel. Um, <clears throat> Andy Jones, who's a, a very good water lawyer, uh, who comes to every meeting and gives us a tremendous amount of input. Uh, one of Reagan's colleagues, Mary Lou Smith, has agreed to facilitate our sessions. We've been funded by the Colorado Water Conservation Board, which has a specific fund looking for alternative transfer methods. And that means alternatives to buy and dry. How can we, uh, and uh, you're gonna see that the, oh. Okay, so, uh, that's the map that Reagan pulled out of his. We both have that slide. Those are the irrigation companies and the different areas that they serve. And the reason we put together a Poudre Basin approach rather than a Larimer County approach is pretty obvious. All of that infrastructure is intertwined. All those diversions, all those ditches, Larimer Weld, it's all hooked together. So we're happy to have the Larimer Weld irrigators and the city of Greeley involved. And we're, we're looking at this as a as a basin problem between the, uh, our whole watershed all the way to the South Platte. Now, none of, not all these partners uh, have the same goals and objectives. The water utilities, again, they want security. They want more storage in some cases, uh, particularly Fort Collins. Uh, and others want more water supply, base supply, raw water to add to the water rights that they have now. We're, uh, in ag, we're after minimizing permanent transfers while protecting property rights. Everybody's a little skeptical about any kind of new program that, you know, I can remember when conservation easements were controversial. Now they're pretty routine. Most farms and ranches accept the concept and, and they have organizations that have legitimatized that with them. But we're still on the cutting edge of these ideas. And that's, you're gonna see some division of the type you're talking about for a while yet. 
suspicion that somehow government's involved and they're going to try to tell me where I can sell my water. But the truth is that none of these alternative mechanisms are uh, regulatory. They're, they're willing seller, willing participant. And we do, both of us, hope to keep more water in the basin because right now uh, the biggest threats are, I think, people that want water for all of those little towns that, that Reagan mentioned. You know, the towns that all want to be Fort Collins, even though they don't have the water supply or the, the same history as we do. Yeah. Can you define buy and dry? Buy is, all right. I'm a water, I'm a water intermediary, and I'm, I'm looking for water for Aurora or for Frederick or Firestone or Decono. Uh, I approach you as, a, as a, somebody who owns water, and I, I might buy your farm with the water. That's what happened with Thornton. Right. They came up and bought a lot of farms that had water. And uh, eventually those farms uh, will be, that water will be transferred. See, that's the, that's the curse along with the blessing of Colorado water law, is that transferability. It's, and Wyoming doesn't have that. You can't use ag water for urban supply. Water, in many more cases, is tied to that ranch, tied to that farm, tied through a U.S. Bureau of Reclamation project that said that's what it was going to be. Here, we can move that water all over the place because of the exchange ability, the reservoirs, the canal system. We can drop it in the river and get it people down, take their water up here. And so, eventually, that person that buys that farm and that water is going to find a way to get, they, they, they may have to build some pipeline, but they're going to get it to Thornton. We're going to get it to Decono, Frederick. And you have to put dry up covenants on that farm afterwards. Well, Colorado law requires you to say, we are not going to allow anybody else to irrigate here once that happens. That's buy and dry. Does that answer your question? Well, kind of, but why did, why did they do that? Why did, Right, but why can't you transfer new water in there to keep that a working farm if that's possible? Well, it's just the rule because they're, everybody's worried about return flows and about all of the other requirements that are, uh, could conceivably circumvent, be circumvented if you allow somebody else to put water on that, on that so place. Okay, so we both hope to be able to keep water in the basin. And notice the difference. Uh, we're all in this together, in this working group, but not everybody has the same needs. Here's, here's the Larimer Well Irrigators. They still own most of their water. They have some CBT water, and they, uh, but they're, mu they're much more reluctant to say, even in a dry year, that we'll share with Greeley because they're growing onions, okay? That's a high dollar crop. And they'll plant whatever onions they can with whatever water is available, and they don't want to share. But on the same time, on that same system, you have people growing small grains that could, could share water. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. Up here, this is us guys in Larimer County. Uh, a lot of us irrigate with North Pooter. And we're much more interested in rental water security. Uh, and more willing to share if we can get that, okay? So, you know, all of these partners in this working group are a little different. Here's Fort Collins. What this shows you is your storage of CBT water. Uh, and Greeley, I'm sorry, the storage per capita. Uh, storage owned or controlled by the provider. Greeley has a lot more storage than Fort Collins does. We're pretty dependent on horse tooth, which we, like Bregan said, we don't own, and we really need uh, projects like Halligan. And we need it for the reason he also, that he described to you. If we're going to share water between ag and urban, they don't just need it in the summer, they need it all year round. So we need to be able to park that shared water somewhere that we can 
And it may be that we can park part of it in the reservoirs we already own, and some of us are scheming about which ones already um, that are lower elevation reservoirs. But anyway, the working group is different, so they all had different kinds of needs, so we knew we were going to have to think about different mechanisms for how to get there. Uh, we've been reinforced. The state uh, the governor has got a state water plan going on and it's got a pretty healthy dose of language in there about you guys need to think about alternative transfer methods. By and dry is not the, the only way to get your water. Um, in communities like Greeley, for example, have you been by the Leprino plant in Greeley? Take Budweiser and multiply it by four. Oh, it's an enormous plant. Built on the old sugar beet plant site. Huh? It's built right where the old Greeley sugar plant Yeah, is, right? right. And 60,000 new dairy cattle have moved into Lermanweld County to supply that. Now tell me how many acres of irrigated forage are necessary for 60,000 dairy new, new cattle. Oh, Yet, yeah, really doesn't have an open space program. They don't have uh, a strategy for minimizing the loss of ag land and water. At least it's not verbalized and, just, and defined as much as our own here in Lamar County. They still think they can have everything. And the Greeley guys that are participating in our group are really a good bunch. They, they see this issue, and they understand, I think, the economics of how do you keep something like Leperino, huge, going to be a huge benefit to Greeley, how do you keep them viable if you're slowly drawing up the resource that they need? So here's what we're working on. I'll give you a real quick overview and then a little bit more detail. We're working on water swaps where we trade decrees. We're working on lease agreements that are more secure and longer term and fairer than the ones we've seen in the past. We're working on interruptible supply agreements, longer term agreements to where farmers would agree to provide some uh, water to municipalities over time uh, from either, mostly from the water that they own. We tried about thinking about the water we rent and we had a couple producers think that that was the way area we really needed to go to and say, all right, well, we won't rent so much water from you, but we'll provide a recharge basin and we'll plant a cover crop on those acres that we normally use your rented water on to enable you to meet state requirements. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in a minute. But, uh, and the, we did the economics on that and it, it still hasn't worked out as much as just using your own owned water as uh, an interruptible supply. Uh, and this one is the one that recently popped up that everybody likes the most. It's called buy and supply. And I'll, I'm gonna tell you about how each of these works here in a minute. Okay, last year um, when we had the wall that water coming off of the High Park fire area and the river was black, and the city couldn't treat that water. It was just so, it had such high carbon loading. We agreed in, to provide, uh, those of us that irrigate with North Poudre agreed to provide our CBT share, which is in Horsetooth, and we'll take the black water. So the city gave us, City Fort Collins gave us an acre and a, 1.5 acre feet for every acre foot of CBT we gave them. They didn't think there would be much response, but they had overwhelming response. All these people were willing to do that sharing, if you will. We had some questions about, and we did have to dredge some, you know, how pivots often irrigate out of a, out of a pond where they run the water into. Some guys had to come in with front end loaders and clean out that, that black sediment. And there was a little bit more wear and tear on the turbine, on, on the impellers and so forth, and the pumps. But for the most part, it worked out pretty well. We got a little more water. Uh, we got some nutrients. And we didn't have too many impacts. So this is an example of a win-win a deal. We didn't, if we could make long-term agreements where X number of farms were always standing by willing to, sh to do that, then that provides some 
security. Water utilities said, all right, but you know, they might sell that farm in 10 years. So there's still, but then the guy from Greeley pops up and says, I'll do it if the farm has a conservation easement on it. So that's kind of one of the, the how the discussion went on this. Uh, it's, it's, it's particularly unique to Fort Collins and North Poudre because of the CBT and there's no recharge, there's no return flow requirements on that. And that really simplifies this type of uh, mechanism. Short-term leases, in 2002, when we ran short of water, everybody ran out to the ag community and said, will you give us some water? And the ag community said, aha, yeah, but it's gonna cost you this much. <laughs> so, and there was a bad, left a bad taste in the mouths of uh, people like the Tri Districts who paid way too much per acre foot for that water. So we're saying, can we come up with reasonable long -term, longer term agreements for people that would be willing to lease some water in a drought year that won't be gouging anybody? And can we use some of the administrative mechanisms already in place at the state level that allow us to do this? I'm gonna put a parenthetical remark in here. The state also has passed legislation now that says, all right, if you're an urban water utility, we'll let you use ag water, even though it's not adjudicated for municipal use, three years in 10 for drought, drought recovery, emergencies, if you're working on a reservoir and you need to drain it, whatever, we'll let you do that three years in 10. So that has been a, that's, uh, plus this piece of legislation has cleared the way for some of this type of water sharing that we're, that we're talking about. All right, this is an interruptible supply agreement and it's different than a lease in that these producers agree to provide, and, and by the way, we're doing this not just for the Poudre Basin. We, the state has asked us to come up with mechanisms that could be considered in other basins. And, and so not everything that we're working on is only for Lemmer and Weld and the Poudre. But the, the concept is this. Can we agree for 10 years or 15 years that if we get a, a situation where we need some more water, uh, usually drought, drought pruning, uh, that you'll fallow some ground, okay? Or you'll use deficit irrigation, what's that? All right, I raise alfalfa, I irrigate, I put up three crops of alfalfa every year. I could, but it'll go dormant if I don't irrigate it after the second cutting. So maybe I just irrigate two cuttings and then I make some water available that way. Um, or you could plant drought resistant crops. So there's different ways that you make the water available. Um, and what's in it for the producer? Well, you, you probably get paid something on the order of what you would make in a, a normal year planting that, that parcel, okay? You, um, you might get rental water guarantee thrown in there um, and so it's, it remains to be seen. This, this has been talked about in different parts of the, the state for some time and there's still some reluctance on the part of both parties because A, maybe the producer just doesn't wanna, I'm gonna try and, farmers like to farm. And to the idea of agreeing ahead of time to not farm so that these guys in town can, uh, you know, dilute their whiskey uh, is just not, is not, doesn't set too good. And, and the water provider says, well, yeah, again, that farm could be sold and then we'd be, and then we really, it's not really a secure supply. So, uh, anyway, we're still working on it. This is the one that I said didn't work out economically, but we're not sure, oops, we're not sure that it might, it couldn't be done. And that is where people rent water, I'll be real nice and say, I won't rent your water this year. 
Well, the town said, what? It's out of water. If we want to use it, we can't. Yeah, no, but wait a minute. I'll provide a recharge basin for your return flows. And I'll, uh, and I'll uh, uh, plant a cover crop so that doesn't blow away. And then you can meet the state requirements for using the ag shares that you own. Okay, so it's kind of, I always thought it was, oh, that still seems a little bit funny to me that, and so we did a, a, an economic analysis on it, and this, which the jury's still out on whether that one is, is uh, going to be too workable. Okay, the last one is the one that everybody said, yes, we think we might be able to live with this one for sure, even though we'll, we'll pilot, we might agree to pilot the other ones and see how they go. We're not going to put everything into it. This is one of my favorite pictures from the farm because that was $8 corn. <laughs> so, and now it's, what is it this year? It's probably four. Yeah. Anyway, that, that, that was a good year. Uh, so what is it? Buy and supply. It is that we'll go and buy a farm and we'll put a conservation easement on it so that the water utility who helps us buy the farm will be satisfied that this is a secure source of, of water and we'll partner with an open space program to, to keep this farm in business and maybe we'll go get some GOCO money or American Farmland Protection Act money now they've got a new name for that and we'll, we'll begin to buy several parcels that would actually and we would put conditions on that easement saying that this farm agrees to provide water to the urban area in a drought, drought farming or drought, reco uh, drought recovery or an emergency. Or you could even say this farm, if it's a farm that's blessed with, like Liz's family's farm has both wells and surface irrigation. So maybe we could, with new efficient techniques, we could actually squeeze out a little water and permanently put it in base supply for that community. See what I mean by base supply? That water then is not just available during a drought year or a drought recovery. It's, it's part of the portfolio that the town that can go change the rights and, and have that water. So uh, this one people seem to like because of the security. The utilities seem to like it. It would be willing seller, willing buyer. Producers, not all of them have heirs and signs may need to sell. There will always be some farmers and ranchers that need to sell. And so one of the questions that we've asked them on a survey we've just sent out is, if you had the option, you needed to sell your farm and your ranch or your water, would you, and a developer was here with cash in hand, if you could get an equivalent amount, even though it wouldn't be so immediate, it might take a little bit of negotiation, a little bit of legal work, and you could sell it to this, this partnership between, it could be eventually we actually have a water bank that does this kind of transaction, but for now we'll probably just start with individual utilities and individual producers. If you could sell to an open space utility GOCO consortium who would pay you pretty much the same price even though it took a little longer, would you be willing to do that? Now, if you're just going to sell and get out and go get your Airstream and go play golf in Arizona, then you might not be willing to do that. But if you really are thinking about your, if you care about agriculture and, you, and you're doing some estate planning, estate planning, that probably is a term that makes, resonates in this room. But uh, <laughs> I need a transition talk with my oldest son. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's the buy and supply concept. And it's the one that the utilities brightened up and said, yeah, we, that's the one we like the best. Um, Did the farmers agree? Pardon? Farmers like that too. We don't know yet. Those of us that have our uh, fingers on the pulse seem to think so because, first of all, 
you get your equity, you realize the equity in your property equally. Your property rights are, it's a willing seller deal. Um, and in Colorado, there's any number of combinations. You know, we have this wonderful tax credit for doing an easement. Do you do the easement first, or do you, do you buy it and then put the easement on it? I mean, there's different ways of doing this. Uh, if you buy it first and then do the easement, it would be a lot easier on the farmer because he could get the money and, you'd, and, and go to Arizona, okay? And so, yeah, you know, that's the part we want to get funded for round two on is to figure out how to do these things in a way that makes the most sense. And we're waiting for feedback from farmers right now. I think as we speak, that survey is finally going out to all the irrigators that asks them about these different mechanisms. Would they be willing to participate? And we'll, have, we'll know a lot more about that. Oh, uh, that's what, so that's what we're doing. That's that slide there. I'm on track. All right, what's, we're, we're hope, what we hope to end up this year is simply to have clear descriptions of different water sharing mechanisms, the perceptions of irrigators and, and shareholders and utilities, prototype agreements for each of these kinds of things, long-term lease, interruptible supply, um, and water uh, decree swaps. We're putting together a database that better describes how all this water works, who has what shares, how much do people rent, how much do they own, and that's not easy either. People play those cards pretty close to their chest, and we haven't had complete buy-in from all the irrigators in, in Weld County on that yet, but we are compiling a, a pretty good database uh, that, or at least a better one than has existed before. Uh, and so we would like to get funded to keep this kind of stuff going and because we really think that we're at a crossroads right now. Um, if, as Benton Mackay says, every healthy community needs some combination of good urban tissue, good pastoral tissue or ag tissue, and good natural and wild tissue, we, uh, we still have the potential for that here. And uh, ag is not dead. I mean, fortunately, commodity prices have been good enough that kids are coming home to farm. You know, the big farm families around here have some kids that have come back and, and wanted to, to get into this. So, and we've got all these young, these young, hardworking kids you see on their hands and knees at the corner of, of Taft and the old 287, Native Hill Farms and places like that. They're real farmers. You know, and part of our struggle is to, to close the gap so that the people in the ag community all consider each other part of that community and not just big guys that, uh, you know, there, there's some really hardworking young farmers that want to get started and, and we can do a certain amount for, for them as well. And a lot of them need these early old ditches like you talked about. They're close to town. There aren't very many parcels left that are served by these because these ditches have the senior rights. You can turn your water on earlier and you, you can leave it on later. And that's what you need if you're growing those vegetables. So that's one of the things that we've been asking the county open space and the city open space programs to do is map those remaining parcels and those remaining water rights so that with some of this open space money we can target a few of those places to help uh, incubators incubate some of these things. Okay, well, body language tells me it's time to quit and, and open it up to questions from you.